All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, and welcome to those of you online. Thank you for being here. Um, we're going to talk about a new approach to multi-tenant wagtails. I'm Stephanie Smith, and this is Addison Hardy, and we're both here uh, from JPL's Design Lab, and we're going to talk with you today about a platform that our team has been working on for about a year now. Uh, before we dive into the details, uh, we want to give you a little bit more context about what we do at JPL and what the landscape of the web is like there. So JPL, or the Jet Propulsion Lab, is one of 12 NASA centers, and it specializes in robotic space and earth science missions. Uh, some of our recent missions include the Mars rover Perseverance, uh, the first ever Mars helicopter, Ingenuity, uh, along with contributions to the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, and as you can imagine, supporting missions like these requires a lot of communication products. And this is where our team comes in. We're a part of Design Lab, uh, which manages hundreds of internal sites for JPL's communications. And we needed to find a sustainable way to support these sites um, and also provide a CMS. Uh, a CMS was very important because we needed our content editors to own their content. Uh, our team is a very small team and we just don't, do not have time to help update content. Um, because of that, another important goal for us was to reduce overall developer overhead. Uh, one of the ways that we did that was uh, by making a primary goal of ours um, to reduce our code bases down from literally almost 100 code bases to one or two. And um, we've been able to now focus on developing a single product. Uh, we also uh, reduced developer overhead by being able to spin up a wagtail site uh, literally at the click of a button without the need for a developer. And that's been uh, really helpful for onboarding new users. Another reason why we wanted to build a platform like this was because uh, over time, um, there's been a lot of branding inconsistency coming up on all of these different sites. Old branding guidelines um, out of date, maybe slight tweaks to one site, but not on the other sites. And with having all of our sites on one platform, we now have the same front end for all of those sites. And if we need to update the styles or update a component, it's updated on all of them. And now I'm going to hand it off to Addison, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the concept behind the management backend, which is one of the keys to our approach to multi-tenant wagtail. Cool. So uh, the management backend. Um, I guess to start off, I um, just want to cover a couple of concepts that will come up uh, throughout the presentation, just so that uh, it all makes sense. Um, so you'll see this prefix uh, WCP uh, that just comes from the internal project name uh, web content platform. And uh, so all of our WCP containers are built from a single code base. So all of the Django and Wagtail code um, and then the management backend, that's all packaged together in a single repo. Um, we've got three branches, development stage and production. And when we push to a branch, it uh, triggers a deployment and builds a new container image from that branch. And that gets deployed into a auto scaling cluster, um, one for each environment. Um, sites can be created and managed via this management backend. And sites are identified by their alias. And that's a, a static identifier. And it's referred to as the uh, WCP underscore alias throughout the platform. And you'll see that variable come up. Um, the rest of the presentation. Uh, each site's data is kept completely isolated from all the other sites. So each site has its own database. Um, if you upload any media, that's all kept separate. All the users are separate. Um, from the end user perspective, it's like they're using a single Wagtail site. Um, and, and for operations, the management backend provides a API and web dashboard um, for our team to help administer uh, the cluster. Uh, infrastructure wise, uh, just a brief overview. Um, we run on AWS and GovCloud, which is, uh, um, if you're not familiar with GovCloud, 
there's a few AWS regions that have like heightened security and compliance for uh, government applications. Um, each environment, again, runs from a single Docker container image. And um, we store those in uh, the Elastic Container Registry, ECR. And then we use uh, Elastic Container Service to run the cluster. And in front of each environment's cluster is a network load balancer. And that's, that's the uh, request entry point uh, into the environment. Uh, so the management backend serves as a wrapper around um, the, the Django Wagtail app, and um, it lets you create new sites, manage existing sites, and it also manages the sort of active container configuration, things like the, the network configuration. Um, the, the management backend has its own database and API, and those exist outside of the context of Django, and that was done so that we could potentially separate them in the future. Um, and uh, we'll talk some more about that at the end of the presentation, uh, sort of future plans. Um, and uh, yeah. All right, so since any of the containers in the cluster can handle requests for any of the sites, um, and, and that includes requests to the management API, um, we needed a way for the containers to let each other know when a, a change is taking place. So let's say you go to the, the management dashboard and you add a host name to a site. Um, that request is going to get routed to one of the containers in the cluster. It'll update the database and then uh, post a notification using the Postgres uh, notification channel uh, to let the other containers know uh, they need to update their configuration. Um, and that lets us add sites and you know, add host names without building new containers or um, you know, needing to do a deployment or anything like that. The, the currently running containers pick up the change and just reconfigure themselves. Uh, so I want to give a, a quick demo of the, the management dashboard. Um, okay, so what you're looking at here, uh, there's, there's two active sites, and this is running in my local environment. Um, so there's the default site, uh, and that's created automatically the first time the container starts up in one of the environments. Um, and the default site is also uh, where the, the API and dashboard live um, on that default site host name. And, and each environment sort of has a root host name. Um, and uh, then uh, there's, there's one additional uh, sort of uh, regular site, um, it's aliases test. And there's links here to view its uh, homepage or to sign into its uh, Wagtail interface. And then for each site, uh, it shows the current hostings. And then you can add and remove um, host names using this, uh, this table right here. Um, and then if you wanted to create a new site, um, let's call it um, Wagtail Space. So if I hit create, um, what the management backend is doing is it's creating a database for the site, running initial migrations to you know, create the initial database schema, um, doing some other kind of management tasks, and then adding that site to the management database um, and then if I give this site a host name, maybe, uh, you know, sample. And this uh, WCP dev, uh, jplweb.net, that's just a host name we use for local dev. Um, so I'll add this. And then if I go to the homepage for the site, you can see uh, I've now got a new Wagtail site and I can sign into it. Um, and up here in the top left, you can see the site alias. Um, so there's the site I just created. And then there's that site with the test alias. All right. Oh, and one other thing, um, there's also the management API specification here and monitoring about the health of the containers uh, available in the dashboard. 
Uh, all right, database overview. So um, yeah, the management backend has its own database and then each site um, has its own database and each environment, all those databases live in, in one Postgres server for each environment. Here's a sort of uh, just overview diagram of, of the overall, overall architecture. So requests come in through the load balancer. They come to one of the containers. Uh, initially, they're picked up by Nginx, and then Nginx decides where to send the request based on the, the host name and the path. So it could be to the management backend or to one of the Django sites. Uh, and this just breaks that out a little bit more. Um, so um, based on the host name and path, Nginx may directly serve a static file um, or static files, and it uses the, we use the send file directive for that sort of an efficient way to, uh, unless you copy files um, directly into the response buffer uh, without uh, sort of duplicating uh, that content in memory twice. I think Netflix contributed that to Nginx. Um, and then dynamic requests are sent upstream to uWSGI, um, which is a library for managing applications uh, uh, over the WSGI protocol. Um, the management backend automatically generates uh, these two types of net network configuration files, so Nginx site files and uWSGI vassal config files. Um, and that happens during container startup or when uh, a container receives a Postgres change notification. Uh, for the Nginx site files, we generate one for each site and one server block, like you can see in the example for each host name. And when a request comes in, Nginx looks at these server blocks and looks at the request host name and finds the one that matches the best. Um, and it has sort of a order of priority for the matching. It looks for an exact match first, then it does a sort of a fuzzy match or a regex. Um, and then um, you can see we're setting this variable WCP alias, and that's a Nginx variable, and it only exists within the context of this server block. Um, and we set it to the site alias. Um, and then we include routing rules uh, from another file. And these route rules, it's, it's how Nginx matches paths. So the, the server block is where the host name is. And then once it's found the server block based on the host name, Nginx looks at the request path and tries to match it against these location uh, blocks. And originally, we were generating these in the site files themselves. Um, but that was causing a lot of duplicated directives, which wasn't that, that big of a deal. But we also wanted to be able to check these route files into the repo and, and sort of edit them as, as code files. And the reason we were generating them in the first place is if you look at the first location block, we're passing that uh, request upstream to uWSGI. And the way we have uWSGI configured is to listen via a socket file for each site. And each site socket file is its name for the site alias. And so we were generating those directives um, from, from Python. But by switching to using this Nginx variable setup, um, then we can include you know, this route file into each server block. You can see this include line at the bottom there. And then that, that variable sets it dynamically. Um, Uwiski, we're running that in emperor mode. And in that mode, Uwiski manages each application as a, a vassal. Um, Uwiski, by the way, has some really interesting naming conventions if you've ever read the documentation. Um, and uh, basically what emperor mode is, is the emperor is sort of like a master process, and then the vassals are, are uh, processes controlled by, by that uh, emperor process. And um, you can, you can uh, configure how many processes you want each vassal to have. And you can give it as many as you want, but it's constrained sort of by the number of CPU cores and, and RAM and things like that. Um, uh, we give each vessel two at the moment in each of our containers. 
Uh, for Django, we're using UWSGI's Python 3 plugin and Django's uh, WSGI mode. And the management backend generates a vast config file for each site. And uh, one of the key things we're doing in there to support the multi tenancy is we're using UWSGI's uh, EMV option. And that lets you set an environment variable in the context of those vassal processes. And the environment variable is called WCP alias. And we set it again to the site's uh, alias, the static identifier. And the way Emperor mode works by default, the way we're using it is uh, basically you tell you whiskey to watch a directory. And if it sees a new configuration file appear in that directory, or if the contents of one of those files changes, then UWSGI will either create a new vassal or reload the existing one. And when the vassal loads up, uh, if you're using the Python 3 plugin um, and pointing it at Django, it loads an instance of the Django application in the memory. And we read this WCP alias environment variable in our Django settings. And those Django settings get evaluated just once when the Django application gets loaded into memory. Um, and I'm going to hand off to Stephanie to talk about uh, what we do with that uh, setting. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so this is an example of what the UWSGI config file looks like. Um, you can see we're, we're setting the socket file name, and that's where Nginx sends the request, uh, Python 3 plugin, and then we set that uh, WCP alias environment variable. Now I'm going to really hand it off. All right. Thanks, Addison. Um, so as Addison said, uh, when a UWSGI vassal loads a Django application, uh, the Django settings are then processed. And uh, most of them are static, but there are a few key settings that are dynamic and that are tied to that same WCP alias environment variable. Um, and those key settings are uh, the cache key prefix, the database name, the wagtail site name, and the S3 bucket folder name. So if we take a closer look at um, the way we've structured the settings inheritance, you can see on the left is where it starts with the base settings file. And that's the file that contains all of these static settings. So these are the settings that are shared across all of our sites. Uh, that is then imported into what we call the dynamic settings file. And there's a code snippet just below uh, showing what that file contains. And you can see it imports uh, the base settings and then it gets the environment variable called WCP alias. And then it uses that environment variable to set things like the database name and the wagtail site name, among other things mentioned in the last slide. And then the last settings file in the inheritance chain is the environment settings file. Uh, and this is the one that has settings specific to our environments. So development, staging, uh, production, and local environments. Um, and so the key here is per environment, the only thing that we actually need to set is the Django settings module environment variable. And we basically set that variable to the environment settings file that we want to use for that environment which is importing the dynamic settings file, which is also importing those base settings. And that's how we generate our settings dynamically. Um, all right, so, uh, so an application instance is loaded into memory, uh, the dynamic settings are processed, uh, and what happens next is uh, during container startup, a task is run to then update the environment. And in that task, which, um, is right here, this code snippet. Um, after the list of sites is retrieved from the environment, uh, functions from the WCP Django class are called for each site. And those functions apply things like new migrations, adding custom permissions, and updating a site index. So this happens for every site in that environment. And if we take a closer look at that WCP Django class, um, well, we use the WCP Django class to call the manage.py uh, call manage.py in the application. And if we look at it more closely, you can see there are a few methods to find. The first one is the manage method. Uh, 
And essentially what that does is it forms a management command, but it's also passing that same environment variable WCP alias. And if you look at the other methods, uh, the migrate permissions and the uh, re-index method, you can see that they are all using that manage method uh, to pass management commands. And again, that means that uh, those methods are essentially passing the environment variable WCP alias. And that is how each site is addressed with these management commands. So in practice, it is possible to um, run a management command on just one specific site. Um, and that kind of uh, blends into our next topic which is a developer experience. So as a developer, what is it like to develop on this platform? And for this talk, we wanted to focus on what the key differences were for developers from a standard Wagtail instance to our multi-tenant platform. And uh, covered in uh, Addison's talk about the management backend, uh, we know that the local environment configuration is the same as the production environment. Um, and that's from all of the dynamic uh, config files uh, being generated and that dynamic settings file that I just uh, talked about. Um, so again, the only thing that needs to change between environment is setting that um, environment settings file through that Django settings module environment variable. Um, and another key difference between um, our multi-platform, uh, multi-site uh, platform is that we can spin up a site uh, quickly, so at the click of a button. So this has been helpful, helpful for onboarding users, but it's also really helpful, helpful for developers. Uh, so that means if you get your database, your local database in a bad state, you can quickly just spin up a new site and destroy the old one. And on top of that, you can spin up as many sites as you want locally, which leads me to my next point, uh, where this then allows you to work on multiple feature branches simultaneously. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how you would go about doing that. So um, locally, so say I was working on a new feature branch. Um, what I might do is I would spin up a new site by clicking on that create site button that Addison showed in his demo of the dashboard. So I have my new site called example created. And maybe I'm making some model changes and I want to create some migration files. Um, so to do that and to only do that for that one site, all I need to do is pass an environment variable with that management command. So in uh, the more verbose ver version, if you're using Docker Compose, for example, should look very familiar with the main difference being that we are passing that same environment variable WCP alias in that first line there. Now to make this a little bit more manageable for us as developers, we've also uh, created dynamic make commands that surprise also pass along that same environment uh, variable of WCP alias. So now it can be as simple as make migrate the alias name of your site, which has been really helpful for us as developers. Uh, and we can, you can also unapply migration. So you can get really complex with your uh, management commands, just as long as you pass that uh, WCP alias. And say you're done with your feature, it's um, code reviewed, merged in, and once it's deployed, that's when the mig new migrations are run for every site in that environment. So locally, you can isolate your migrations, but at deployment, that's when it's run for everything. And so with that, I'm going to pass it back to Addison, who's going to talk about what we can do next or what we're hoping to do next with our multi-tenant platform. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, so um, we, we've been um, thinking about sort of the future roadmap for the, the management backend uh, at GPL and, and just in general. Um, we went through uh, GPL's process over the past month um, and, and got permission to open source uh, everything. So we're working on doing that over the next um, probably two to three months. Uh, we need to you know, package the code base and write documentation and stuff, but we wanna get uh, 
the, the management back end code open source. And um, the other thing we've been talking a lot about is potentially separating the management back end out into its own repo and not having any of the application code live in that repo and introducing a new, uh, a new concept uh, for the management backend, which would be a service type. So a service, when you would create one, like if, if you went into the dashboard, there'd be a services tab. And um, each service would have a static identifier. You'd give it a git repo URL and a branch name. And um, when what would get uh, built as the container image would be just the management backend. And when it deployed during container startup, it would get all of the current services and sites. And for each service, it would do like a shallow clone of, of that Git repo and, and branch. There'd be a services folder and it would clone each service into a folder in the services folder named as the service uh, identifier. And then when you created a site, um, you could choose from one of the service types. And um, to support that, Just wanted to briefly show this. Um, so we're envisioning having a, sort of a known configuration file that would live in the root of these service repos. And it might be called wcp.yaml or something like that. And uh, we'd have a documented spec for this configuration file. But just as a quick example, it might have a service type like Django. And it might have various action scripts. So a setup script. So after the container clones down the repo, during startup, it would also point on the repo if a new service got created. Um, it, it would run the setup script to like install the services, Python, NPM dependency, stuff like that. And then it might have a tenant script and the management backend would call that tenant script once for each site of that service type. But again, passing that WCP alias environment variable. Um, uh, and you know, it's to the script, and then that script could do site specific actions like run migrations. Um, and there's just uh, some quick examples of that here. Um, and uh, that's something that we're still, you know, actively working on the, uh, the architecture for. Uh, but that's just kind of a quick look at uh, where we're going. And I um, want to say thank you to the rest of our team who's not here today. Uh, that's it. It was my fault. I forgot to give you the signal to stop us too wrapped up in, in your presentation. Um, do you mind taking questions on Slack and in the hallway as people are? Yeah, you know? please. Yeah. Uh, great presentation. I, I apologize for not giving you time at the end. No, no worries. No problem. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.